a pleasant day to you, and welcome to BC News Network. I am Kirkou G. And I am Mainalat D. Maipa. Coming up, international news in BC today. On international concern, the World Health Organization has declared the coronavirus disease in 2019, or COVID-19, as a public health emergency of international concern after an emergency meeting on Thursday. A universal human connection. Scientists are perplexed as they have found out that even Africans have Neanderthal DNA, a gene that was once thought to be unique to Europeans and Asians. A sorrowful yet celebrated farewell. The United Kingdom has officially left the European Union after 47 years of membership and more than three years after it voted to do so in a referendum. We begin this day with the bad news. As the World Health Organization has declared the COVID-19 outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern. This declaration came after cases of human-to-human -human transmissions were confirmed outside China with the outbreak has started. The number of cases of the virus, which has killed 3,220 people, shot up to more than 94,170 internationally. The infection rate of this virus is higher than that of the SARS epidemic in 2002 to 2003. However, the current case fatality rate for this virus which is around 3.4%, is lower than that of the SARS 9.6% mortality rate. And now, let us hear BACR in Pampanya as she expansively reports such topic. Airports, seaports, all transportation systems shut down. This is one of the cautious moves of humanity in hopes of limiting the transmission rate of this voracious COVID-19. As of January 30, 2020, 8,200 people are infected with this virus and about 215 died. This promptly led the WHO Director Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus to announce a declaration that the virus is now considered to be an international concern on Thursday in Geneva, Switzerland. Though the statistics of infected people and the morality rate is low, this should not let people be off guard. Because as infection rate rises, so does the probability of an increased mortality rate. On January 23, authorities introduced travel restrictions in three cities, Wuhan, Wungang, and Izu, affecting 20 million people. Within days, the quarantine was extended to additional provinces and cities, impacting more than 50 million people in total. It's a matter of all quarantine, University of Michigan medical historian Howard Markle told the Washington Post, I could never have imagined it. Public transfers has been suspended, flights cancelled, inter-province bus services stopped. On January 25, Chinese citizens with holiday plans received bad news. President Xi Jinping said the new virus posed a grave threat, and his government ordered travel agency to halt tours for Chinese. And here we have BAC Aryan with our studio. Aryan, what's the status there in Wuhan right now? People are still under quarantine here, Luigi. You can really count by finger the only bystander here in Wuhan. And only handful are in commercial buildings, securing their stock of food and necessities, panic buying and such. That really must be scary there, Aryan. Indeed, Maya. I have heard on certain sources that the Wuhan public seafood market is not really the epicenter of the said virus. Is that true? This is yet to validate it, Maya. Because the first victim who went to a hospital to be checked seems do not have any correlation with the market at all. And out of the first 42 diagnosed, only 27 of the people had interaction with the market. Scientists implies that the outbreak is multi-sourced. Some people are really furious about the travel bans imposed by the Trump administration and many other countries from and to some specific regions in China. How concrete are their oppositions? Is banning the transportation system of some Chinese regions really that effective? Gee, here's the thing. History shows these types of travel restrictions aren't very helpful in stopping outbreaks. At best, they delay the spread of disease but don't impact the number of people who eventually get sick. They're also not compatible with the interconnection nature of modern travel and trade. People will always find way to evade them. Going underground or traveling in spite of the restrictions. That's not to mention the economical and psychological burden they impose. 
more often than not, health officials are several steps behind the spreading epidemic. And when they aren't, the history books show. They tend to act too fast, costing a fortune or fairly discriminating against some population, as the quote Markle in the Times. Thank you very much, Ariane, for the wonderful coverage. And now, let's head on to the next news. A new study unravels an unexpectedly large amount of Neanderthal ancestry in modern populations across Africa. The researchers found that African individuals, on average, had significantly more Neanderthal DNA than previously thought, about 17 megabases worth or 0.03% of their genome. Now, let us hear BACEJ for further reports. For 10 years, geneticists have told the story of how Neanderthals, or at least their DNA sequences, live in today's Europeans, Asians, and their descendants. Not so in Africans, the story goes, because modern humans and our extinct cousins interbred only outside of Africa. How did they find out this discovery, you may wonder? The best fit model where for where Africans got all this Neanderthal DNA suggests about half of it came when Europeans, who had Neanderthal DNA from previous matings, migrated back to Africa in the past 20,000 years. The model suggests the rest of the DNA shared by Africans, the, Alpha, the Altai Neanderthal might not be Neanderthal at all. Instead, it may be DNA from early modern humans that was simply retained in both Africans and Eurasians, and was picked up by Neanderthals, perhaps when moderns made a failed migration from Africa to the, to the Middle East more than 100,000 years ago. We also want to clear up this mysterious disparity. Why do East Asians appear to have more Neanderthal ancestry than Europeans? According to Kelly Harris University of Washington, Luigi, Seattle has suggested East Asians have 20% more Neanderthal DNA than Europeans. Researchers previously assumed that Neanderthal sequences shared by Europeans and Africans were modern and subtracted them up. After correcting the bias, the new study found similar amounts of Neanderthal DNA in Europeans and Asians, 51 megabases and 55 megabases respectively. This discovery is not only limited to its contribution to the scientific world, but also to the entire human race. May the discovery be the bridge that would connect us all to disregard our differences and embrace the humanity within ourselves. Back to you, studio. Thank you for that elaborate report on the topic, EJ. Heading on, after four years of vouching to leave the European Union, Brexit has finally been achieved. And now let us hear BAC reporter Nemart Kleinbaro for the news. As the clock struck 11 p.m. GMT, the article process by which a member state leaves the European Union expired and the UK has now entered the transition process, it agreed with the bloc. For the first time ever, the European Union is now a member state. It's a monumental moment that will go down in history, for better or worse. With this, the question would surely be, what would happen now? In the short term, the biggest changes will be visible to the public. During the transition period, currently set to expire on December 31 in this year, the UK will continue to obey EU laws and European courts. Businesses will be able to operate as normal and people wanting to travel around the EU will not be affected. However, Brexit is far from done. Before the transition period ends 11 months from now, the UK will try and negotiate a deal with Brussels on their future relationship. Failure to reach an agreement would mean the hardest Brexit possible, causing economic damage for both sides and possibly the wider world. This is a scenario that both sides are eager to avoid. These negotiations will begin on March 3. In the meantime, both parties will work to establish their priorities and red lines. The UK will probably want to have its cake and eat it. Near frictionless, trade with the EU while enjoying the freedom to do as it pleases at home and strike trade deals with the wider world. And now we have here BAC Nemer live on the EU Court of Justice. So, what's happening there, Nemer? As you can see, Luigi, the European Union director is speaking about the secession of the UK and the effect with this. UK participants cheering and some feeling reminiscing already. What a sorrowful moment it really is for the EU. Well, EU's priority will be keeping the UK as close 
to EU regulations as possible and protect the European interests. I'm sure that would be difficult to achieve. So, what would be the results of this exit? Many effects would happen as a product of this occurrence. One of which would be the threat of Scotland to announce their wants of sovereignty and independence of the United Kingdom. Also, the freedom of trade and immigration from United Kingdom to EU and vice versa would be limited. This is one of the byproducts of humanity's innate instincts of wanting sovereignty and independence. But let this event not cause emergence. Because in order for mankind to grow, we must unify. Now, the stage is yours, studio. Thank you for the expanded report on Brexit, Namert. With that, BC News Report will return shortly after a commercial break. Time to beat Energy Gap. Let's do champ moves like James. Low energy, but I'm like low focus ka, baka energy gap, yeah. Four out of five kids have it. Energize. Start your day the champion way. I'll be energy, energy gap, be energy gap. Break Milo every day. Milo every day. With your three balanced meals, be energy gap. Break Milo every day. Milo every day. Get yeah, winning energy. School and play, be a champ every day. Healthy energy, energy gap, be energy gap, break my low every day. My low every Get ready as we bring the all new Milo champ moves to your school. Hello and welcome everyone to BC News Network. Now let us proceed with the national headlines. A rampant infection. The DOH has announced the first infected person with COVID-19 here in the Philippines. A pressure burster. After 42 years, on January 12, 2020, the Taal volcano has violently erupted, causing mass evacuations and some panic. A swine attack. In September 2019, here in the southern Philippines, African swine fever, a virus responsible for causing diseases onto one of our food supplies, pigs, has infected the meat supplies of people and animals, and the livelihood of pigs. The Philippines confirmed its first case of COVID-19, a 38-year-old woman who traveled to the Philippines from Wuhan, China, and then later, its first death. Here we have reporting live BAC Kalokit for such topic. The Philippines on Thursday, January 30, confirmed its first case of COVID-19. The Philippines' first COVID-19 patient is among the 29 people monitored by the Department of Health, or DOH. Health Secretary Francisco Doque III said in a news briefing on Thursday. Doque said the patient is a 38-year-old woman who traveled to the Philippines from Wuhan, China, via Hong Kong on January 21. She is currently in a government hospital where she was admitted on January 25, but was no longer showing symptoms. The OH Epidemiology Bureau Director Fachito Avencino said authorities would check the establishments that she went to and trace employees she had been in contact with. A couple of days later, the Department of Health announced Sunday the country's first death of a patient who tested positive for COVID-19. The first reported death due to the virus outside of China. A 44-year-old Chinese man was also the Philippines' second confirmed case of COVID-19. Died Saturday, the DOH said. He was the partner of the 38-year-old Chinese woman who last week became the first confirmed case of the new virus in the country. DOH Secretary Francisco Doque III said the man was admitted to San Lazaro Hospital. On January 25, he had pneumonia, fever, cough, a sore, sore throat. Over the course of the patient's admission, he developed severe pneumonia. In his last few days, the patient was stable and showed signs of improvement. However, the condition of the patient deteriorated within the last 24 hours, resulting in his demise. Doki said he added that aside from being infected with COVID-19, the man was also infected with influenza B virus and streptococcus pneumoniae bacteria.
Currently, there are 24 persons under investigation and three confirmed cases of COVID-19. Here we have BAC Kyle Lockett with our studio. Now, Kyle, we have questions. First, what are the symptoms of COVID-19? The symptoms are fever, cough, and difficult in breathing. Well, what are the best preventions for this virus? Well, Luigi, we can avoid this virus from spreading by maintaining hand hygiene, avoiding close contact with sick people, and lastly, covering your mouth when you sneeze or cough. Remember, prevention is better than cure. Back to you, studio. With the national coverage in COVID-19, Kyle. Next in the news... Taal volcanic eruption in February 14, 2020, Friday, was lowered from Alert Level 3 to Alert Level 2. This is due to weak steam or gas emissions at the main crater for the past three weeks, following its eruption on January 12, 2020. Now let us hear Isaac Gloria live from Talisay, Batangas. On January 14, Friday, Fivox has downgraded the Alert Level status of Taal Volcano at Alert Level 2. The reasons for the downgraded are stabilizing ground deformation of the Taal Caldera and Taal Volcano Island edifices. Data from January 13 to February 11 showed net subsidence or downward settling of the Taal Caldera and Taal Volcano Island. According to authority, there is mere relaxation of the volcano edifices after the movement of magma stopped. Weak steam and gas emissions at the main crater. Sulfur oxide or SO2, a major gas component of magma has averaged only 62 tons per day since January 26. The weak steam-laden plumes seen at the main crater are also consistent with decreased magmatic advance and less frequent volcano earthquake activity. And now here we have BC Isaac in communication with the studio. Isaac, give an inquiry. As the alert level is lowered, are the people allowed to go back to their houses? There were over 11,013 persons staying at the evacuation center. However, they're still not allowed to go to their houses. Local government units are advised to additionally assess previously evacuated areas within 7 km radius damage and road accessibilities and to strengthen preparedness, contingency, and communication in case of renewed unrest. How frequent does volcanic earthquake occur as the alert level lowered? According to advisory, DOST FIVOX, a total of 77 volcanic earthquakes recorded by the Taal Volcano Network. Such earthquakes mean magma continues to move beneath the volcano, which may lead to an eruption at the main center. That's why state volcanologists cautioned the public that lowering of the alert level does not mean that all unrest has completely stopped or the threat of an eruption has disappeared. Now, back to you, studio. Thank you for the coverage of the Taal volcanic eruption, Isaac. Further on, the first ASF outbreak in the southern Philippines in Davao Occidental disturbed the food and other soil product supplies of the economy and agricultural life. Now let us hear Paula Basan as she prepared her report on ASF. Samples taken from pigs in southern province in the Philippines, the world's 10th largest pork consumer, tested positive for African swine fever virus. The Department of Agriculture it said Sunday, February 2, 2020. It was first reported case of African swine fever infections in Davao Occidental province and elsewhere in Mindanao, the southern island of the Southwest Asian nation. Agriculture Secretary William Dar has ordered regional department officials to restrict animal movement in that part of the archipelago, the department said in a statement. The Philippines, also the world's seventh largest pork importer, reported its first ASF outbreak in September 2019 in some backyard. The disease quickly spread to the other parts of the main island of Luzon, including Manila, prompting some central and southern provinces to ban pork and pork-based products from disease heat areas. There was no regular vaccination, vitamin supplementation, and deworming of pigs in the province. And household butchering is common, especially with animals exhibiting weakness or disease, it said. Around a thousand pigs in Davao Occidental have been called amid the outbreak. According to the local media reports, citing information from provincial government, though not harmful to humans, the disease is deadly to pigs, with no vaccine available. Now here we have Basie Paula in contact with the studio. Paula! Does ASF infect humans? Well, Luigi, according to the Department of Agriculture, ASF by no means can infect humans, as human genomics are much more complex than that of swans. But let this not catch us off guard as this strain of virus may mutate to infect humans. Where does ASF come from? 
Well, African Swine Fever, or ASF, was discovered by Montgomery in Kenya in 1921 as a new disease causing high moralities in recently imported European pigs. Following decades, ASF was observed in several sub-Saharan countries. Well, what can the public do? For swine racers, the Department of Agriculture reminds them to enhance biosecurity measures and promptly report any unusual animal deaths in their respective farms. For consumers, the government advises them to remain vigilant when buying pork and pork products, to always look for NMIS sale as a guarantee. Back to you, Studio. Thank you for the national report on the ASF outbreak, Paula. That's the end of the national coverage. With this, we'll come back shortly after a commercial break. Finger and Clover, they go together Finger and Clover, my love affair Semut sarap kasama ang Clover! A pleasant day and welcome back to our news network. This time, let us head on to the local headlines. COVID-19 in Davao? There are currently 17 persons under investigation or PUIs suspected to have COVID-19 in Davao region as of Thursday, as reported by the Department of Health COVID tracker. A surrender to pursue hope. New People's Army rebels yield so many firearms to the Sangani province local authorities in hopes of garnering a beautiful future. One use plastic free future. The Davao City government moves to ban the usage of single use plastics or SUPs in hopes of lessening the byproducts of such pollutants. PUIs had been released on Wednesday after they tested negative for COVID-19. Now let us hear BC Zabala reporting in SPMC Davao City. Dr. Ricardo Aldan, SPMC of Chief Clinics and Health Emergency Management Bureau coordinator said Thursday, February 13, they had released the patient on Wednesday after the result on the patient's sample tested negative of the virus. Aldan added that they are still waiting for the result of the other PUI before they will allow the patient to return home. SPMC has six isolation facilities housed in a separate building with negative pressure. Based on the Department of Health COVID-19 tracker, as of Thursday, the number of PUIs in Davao region reached 15 from Wednesday's 13. Two new PUIs have been added to the list. Aside from SPMC, DOH Davao said Davao Regional Medical Center or DRMC is also equipped with the isolation facility to cater PUIs. The health department said the confirmed case in the country remains a three and two of the patients are no longer admitted in the hospitals, while the other one perished from the disease. Contract tracing is being done by the health officials in coordination with the Philippine National Police or PNP to locate the people who had close contact with the confirmed patients. To date, Davao region has no confirmed case of COVID-19. Meanwhile, the DOH echo echoed their health advisory to the public to practice frequent and proper hand washing, practice proper cough etiquette, always bring a handkerchief, tissue, cover, mouth and nose using uh, using handkerchief or tissue. Sleeves or crook of the elbow may also be used to cover the mouth when coughing or sneezing. To prevent acquiring and spreading of the disease, they also encourage moving away from people coughing, not to spit anywhere, throw use tissues properly, always wash hands after sneezing or coughing, use alcohol sanitizer, avoid unprotected contact with farm or animals, ensure that the food is well cooked, and maintain a healthy lifestyle to mount up immunity and to keep a oneself protected against the virus. And that's all for now. This is Bay AC Zabala. Now back to you, studio. Thank you, Zabala, for the life-threatening report on possible COVID-19 patients in the Davao region. Heading on, 
Three members of the NPA from Malapatan, Sarangani province were added to the numbers of the communist rebels who surrendered to the authorities to live a happy life with their respective families in the mainstream society. And here's BAC Aryan as she elaborates the news. In the press statement released on Monday, Lieutenant Colonel Ronaldo G. Valdez, commanding officer of the Army 73rd Infantry Battalion, or IB, based in Barangay Ferris, Makita Town, Davao Occidental, said the surrenderees brought with them two high-powered firearms. Valdez further said the NPA rebels were members of the weakened Guerrilla Front 71 of the far south Mindanao region of CPP-NPA. The military identified them with the alliances for security reasons, as Botyok, a supply officer of Front 71. He handed over an M16 rifle to the troops of 73rd IB. Jack also gave up his M1 Garand rifle and a certain Tayong. Since January this year, a total of 23 rebels opted to abandon their armed struggle against the government and yielded to the armed military or the police to avail the benefits offered to them under the current administration. And that is all. Back to you. Thank you, Aryan, for the elaboration on the surrender of the rebels. Next on the news, the government of Davao City proposes an ordinance on SUPs to lessen the rise of plastic pollutions on February 19. With this, let us catch on to BAC EJ as he takes his report. The city government of Davao will soon ban the use of single-use plastics or SUPs. Here, once the measure regulating the SUPs passed in the local council, Interface Inter Development Interventions or IDIS Executive Director Chinky P. Gole said. She said on Wednesday that the proposed measure, which had passed three hearings in the Committee on Environment, chaired by 2nd District Councillor Justado Mahipos, would ban specific SUPs defined as disposable plastics designed or placed on the market to be used once over a, si a short time span before being disposed or discarded. Now we have here BEC EJ with their studio. So EJ, what are the specific SUPs banned in Davao? The proposed ordinance specifically identified SUPs as plastics, plastic drinking cups, plastic condiments, sauce or gravy container, both recyclable and non-recyclable, plastic cup lids or covers, plastic stirrers, plastic cutlery or spoon, knife or fork, plastic straws, plastic meal packaging, plastic hand gloves, plastic materials used as buntings, and plastic materials used as balloon sticks. So what would be the impact if SUPs would not be banned in Davao? The impact the SUPs would cause to the environment because plastics are non-biodegradable, staying in the environment for thousands of years, and would produce toxic chemicals that are harmful to human health when incinerated, causing cardiovascular disease to cancer and autoimmune conditions. So given these measures, what would then be the beneficial effects in the environment and on us? The ban on SUPs would help lessen the production of wastes that end up on the 7 hectare sanitary landfill located in New Carmen Tugbok, which has nearly reached its maximum capacity, Goldie said. And that will be all. Back to you, BAC Studio. Thank you, EJ, for uttering such measures by Davao. That would be indeed beneficial to us and the environment. So that would end our report on contemporary issues of the world and of the nation. Now let's move on to the sports news. Good morning to each and every one of the audience. Good morning to you, studio. So here we have Mr. Christopher Espinoza with us today. Thank you so much, Mr. Christopher, for giving us time to interview you today. So when did you start playing tennis? Uh, I played tennis when I was four years old until now. Oh. <clears throat> Is this your first time playing in Davra? No. Uh, I qualified for Dabra when I was grade 3 until now. Okay, so what is your category in playing tennis for Dabra? Uh, doubles. Of all sports, why tennis? Kaya akong lolo, nagadulag tennis. Akong papa, nagadulag tennis. Hindi pa dula ang kanila para fun. Okay, so given that you're relatively young, what do you aspire to be when you grow up? A uh, seaman and also a prof professional tennis player. Oh, okay. All right, that would conclude our interview. Thank you so much, Mr. Christopher, for letting us interview you today. Once again, this is BAC Paula. Back to you, studio. Thank you, Paula, for that interview on what he shares his preparations for the upcoming Dabra Meet. With this, let us head on to the feature segment.
a new episode from the Denmark The Explorer Show he says they recently started Eat All You Can restaurant in Daegu City. Let us watch the video. I wonder what business could I feature tonight? Oh, oh Nani Behind's restaurant. Eat all you can for 159 passes only. Come on guys and explore this wonderful restaurant. Together with the co-owner of this restaurant, Miss Padragosa. So first of all, I would like to say thank you to Miss Padragosa for sharing your time to me. So ma'am, how did you come up with this restaurant name? Uh, I ca we came up with this uh, restaurant name because my grandma, who recently just passed away like uh, two years ago, her name was Bihing. Her nickname was Bihing. So we came up with Nanay Bihing. So ma'am, when did this restaurant first open? Uh, we opened around uh, last year, September. Then, what is the schedule of the restaurant po ma'am? Uh, since we started the Eat All You Can buffet, uh, for the lunch we open around 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. And for the dinner, we open at 5.30 p.m. to 1 p.m. And it's every day. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any branches aside from Digo City, po, ma'am? Uh, currently, no branches. But originally, this we had a catering and a restaurant in Davao City. And then we closed it and then we opened up here in Digo City. Then, what is or are your best sellers? Here, Pop Ma'am. Um, before we started the Eat All You Can, uh, our best sellers used to be um, beef steak, um, chicken cordon bleu, um, chop soy, pancit canton, and the uh, basic uh, snacks like halo halo and stuff like that. So, Ma'am, how does your business generate an income? Po? Um, we well, the restaurant only generates income if uh, people will eat in our restaurant. I uh, think, yeah. Then, why did you think of having an Eat All You Can oh. event? Uh, we thought that uh, it would be one of the ways that we can uh, generate more income in this our establishment. Thank you, ma'am. So, ma'am, above all businesses, why restaurant? Um, it, it has been a lifelong dream of my mother to build a restaurant. Uh, so, uh, she's been planning to uh, have it for years and then eventually she made it happen. So, I think that would suffice, ma'am. Thank you for giving your precious time with us, but ma'am. And I hope that this restaurant will progress in the near future. That would be all. And once again, this is BAC Namart at Klein and Baro. Tune in for more future episodes. Maya, I think we and the crew should go there sometime. Indeed, Luigi. Nanay Bing surely caters our delicate ones. That is correct. And that would be all for today's report. Tune in to the next BAC News Report to cope up with the world's current issues, even some sports news and featured businesses. Once again, you're watching BAC News Network. Network. Of the, the people, people, for the people. people. Good day, everyone. everyone.